It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our children. Civil Rights Through the Black Power Era Religious Struggles in Prison Meanwhile, behind the walls, smart segments of new Africans began rejecting Western Christianity. They turned to Islam as preached by Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam, NOI, and Noble Drew Ali's Muslim Science Temple of America, MST. The NOI preached that Islam was the true religion of black people, that blacks were the original people on earth, and that blacks in America were a nation needing land and independence. The MST preached that the Asiatic black people in America must proclaim their nationality as members of the ancient Moors of Northern Africa. These new religions produced significant success rates in helping new African prisoners rehabilitate themselves by instilling them with a newfound sense of pride, dignity, piety, and industriousness. Yet these religions seemed strange and thus threatening to prison officials. They moved forthwith to suppress these religions, and many early Muslims were viciously persecuted, beaten, and even killed for practicing their beliefs. The Muslims fought back fiercely. Civil Rights Struggles in Prison Like American society, the prisons were rigidly segregated. New Africans were relegated to perform the heaviest and dirtiest jobs, farm work, laundry work, dishwashing, garbage disposal, and were restricted from jobs as clerks, straw bosses, electricians, or any position traditionally reserved for white prisoners. Similar discriminatory rules applied to all other areas of prison life. New Africans were restricted to live in certain cell blocks or tiers, eat in certain areas of the mess hall, and sit in the back of the movies, TV room, and other recreational facilities. Influenced by the anti-discrimination aspect of the civil rights movement, a growing number of new Africans behind the walls began stepping up their struggle against discrimination in prison. Audacious new African began violating long-standing segregation codes by sitting in the front seats at the movies, mess hall, or TV areas, and more than a few died from shanks in the back. Others gave as good as they got, and better. Additionally, new Africans began contesting discriminatory job and housing policies and other biased conditions. Many were set up for attack and sent to the hole for years or worse. Those who were viewed as leaders were dealt with most harshly. Most of this violence came from prison officials and white prisoners protecting their privileged positions, other violence came from new Africans and Muslims protecting their lives, taking stands and fighting back. From these silent, unheralded battles against racial and religious discrimination in prisons emerged the new African liberation struggle behind the walls during the 1950 civil rights era. Eventually, the courts, influenced by the equality anti-discrimination aspect of the civil rights movement, would rule that prisons must recognize the Muslims' religion on an equal footing with other accepted religions, and that prison racial discrimination codes must be outlawed. Black Power Through the Black Liberation Era As the civil rights movement advanced into the 60s, new African college students waded into the struggle with innovative lunch counter sit-ins freedom rides, and voter registration projects. On April 15, 1960, a student conference was called under the auspices of Miss Ella Baker, a field worker for the SCLC. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, was formed during this period to coordinate and instruct student volunteers in nonviolent methods of organizing voter registration projects and other civil rights work. These energetic young students, and the youth in general, 
served as the foot soldiers of the movement. They provided indispensable services, support, and protection to local community leaders such as Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Septima Clark, Bob Moses, Amzie Moore, Daisy Bates, and other heroines and heroes of the civil rights movement. Although they met with measured success, white racist atrocities mounted daily on defenseless civil rights workers. Young new Africans, in general, began to grow increasingly disenchanted with the nonviolent philosophy of Martin Luther King. Many began to look increasingly towards Malcolm X, the fiery young minister of NOI Temple No. 7 in Harlem, New York. He called for self-defense, freedom by any means necessary, and land and independence. As Malcolm Little, he had been introduced to the NOI doctrine while imprisoned in Massachusetts. Upon release, he traveled to Detroit to meet Elijah Muhammad, converted to Islam, and was given the surname X to replace his discarded slave master's name. The X symbolized his original surname lost to history when his four parents were kidnapped from Africa, stripped of their names, language, and identity, and enslaved in the Americas. As Malcolm X, he became one of Elijah Muhammad's most dedicated disciples and rose to national minister and spokesperson for the NOI. His keen intellect, uncorruptible integrity, staunch courage, clear resonant oratory, sharp debating skills, and superb organizing abilities soon brought the NOI to a position of prominence within the black ghetto colonies across the U.S. Origin of the Revolutionary Action Movement During the fall of 1961, an off-campus chapter of the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, formed at Ohio's Central State College, called Challenge. Challenge was a black radical formation having no basic ideology. Part of its membership was students who had been expelled from Southern schools for sit-in demonstrations. Students who had taken freedom rides and students from the North some of whom had been members of the NOI and African nationalist organizations. Challenge's main emphasis was struggling for more students' rights on campus and bringing a black political awareness to the student body. In the year-long battle with the college's administration over student rights, members of Challenge became more radicalized. Challenge members attended student conferences in the South and participated in demonstrations in the North. Donald Freeman, a black student at Ohio's Case Western Reserve College, maintained correspondence with Challenge's cadre, who discussed the ideological aspects of the civil rights movement. In the spring of 1962, Studies on the Left, a radical quarterly, published Harold Cruz's article, Revolutionary Nationalism and the Afro-American. Freeman wrote a letter to Challenge Cadre telling them to seriously study the article. He also said black radicals elsewhere were studying the article and that a movement had to be created in the North similar to the NOI, using the tactics of SNCC but outside of the NAACP and CORE. After much discussion, the cadre decided to form a board condition to take over student government at Central State. Meetings were held with representatives from each class, fraternities, and sororities. A slate was drafted and a name for the party was selected. It was called RAM, R-A-M, later to be known as the Revolutionary Action Movement. The Challenge Cadre met and decided to dissolve itself into RAM and become the RAM leadership. RAM won all student government offices. After the election, the inner RAM Corps discussed what to do next. Some said that all that could be done at Central State had already occurred, while others disagreed. Some of the inner Corps decided to stay at Central State and run the student government, while a few decided to return to their communities and attempt to organize around Freeman's basic outline. 
Two of the returning students were Wanda Marshall and Max Stanford, now named Akbar Muhammad Ahmad, who transplanted Ram from Cleveland to the ghettos of Philadelphia, New York, and other urban areas. The March on Washington In 1963, Malcolm X openly called the March on Washington a farce. He explained that the desire for a mass march on the nation's capital originally sprang from the black grassroots, the average black man, black woman in the streets. It was their way of demonstrating a mass black demand for jobs and freedom. As momentum grew for the march, President Kennedy called a meeting of the leaders of the six largest civil rights organizations, dubbed the Big Six, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, Congress of Radical Equality, CORE, National Urban League, NUL, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the National Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, NBSCP, and asked them to stop the proposed march. They answered saying that they couldn't stop it because they weren't leading it, didn't start it, and that it had sprung from the masses of black people. Since they weren't leading the march, the president decided to make them the leaders by distributing huge sums of money to each of the big six, publicizing their leading roles in the mass media and providing them with a script to follow regarding the staging of the event. The script planned the march down to the smallest detail. Malcolm explained that government officials told the Big Six what time to begin the march, where to march, who could speak at the march and who could not, generally what could be said and what could not, what signs to carry, where to go to the toilets provided by the government, and what time to end, and most of the 200,000 marchers were never the wiser. By then, SNCC's membership was also criticizing the march as too moderate and decrying the violence sweeping the South. History ultimately proved Malcolm's claim of farce correct. Through books published by participants in the planning of the march and through exposure of government documents on the matter.